So I got a question for you this morning. How many of you remember when you were like a little kid, probably between the ages of five and 10, somebody asked you what you wanted to be when you grew up? How many of you remember what you said you wanted to be when you grew up? How many of you remember that? All right, now here's an awkward thing. Dominique, who's playing keys back there, this morning I asked that question to our volunteers, and she said this with a straight face. She said, I wanted to be a carrot. I, and she was like, yeah. And, I, and so then afterwards, she plussed it. She said, after I realized I couldn't be a carrot, I told my mom I wanted to be a school bus. And, and I was like, there is a reason why she's married to Alan Keller. Like that, that, I, I, that, that, is, a, that is a perfect marriage right there. It's just perfect. It's perfect. But all right, how many of you in here today are doing what you said was your dream thing when you were a kid? How many of you are doing it right now? How many of you are doing it? Like so few of you. That's, that's what's funny is because when you ask kids what they want to be when they grow up, a lot of times they're going to say doctors and nurses, and I heard a ton of that this morning. Somebody might say a police officer or an astronaut or a professional athlete. I will tell you this. If you were to ask me when I was eight years old, if I wanted to be a pastor, I'd went, uh, because I actually said that when I was in college. I was like, why would I want to do that? Like, that would be the, the worst thing in the world. And I had to go back and apologize to one of my high school teachers who had kind of spoken that into my life. And he said, Paul, I think, I think God might want you to be in ministry. And I laughed in his face. And then he got the last laugh on that deal. Um, so what, what I know is this, is that when you're young, you just assume that you'll end up doing something that matters. And I have spoken with, with countless numbers of adults who feel like what they do doesn't matter. And I believe that we have been talking over the past couple of weeks that, that we believe that God says we're made for more. And if we are made for more and we're made on purpose for a purpose, then what you do matters. And we have to begin to shift our thinking. My prayer is that over the past four weeks, what you've recognized is that you were made by God to be loved by God. You were made by God to be loved by God, not so that you could do something for God, not so that you could do something that, that, that God wants you to do because he wants you to do something for him. He doesn't need you to do something for him. He made you so that he could love you. First and foremost, and you have to get that right. And then we talked about that we were made to belong and that we are made to, to live in community, which is why here at Relevant Church, we literally talk about like what Hannah talked about. It's like, don't just come in and then walk out. Like, find some people. Like, find some people that can be your people, that you can do life together with. Because doing life together with other people is exactly how God wired us to be. And Jesus modeled all of this. Like, he modeled it with his disciples, and then last week, Pastor David did a great job on, on sharing with us that we were made to become like Christ. We were made to grow in our relationship with Christ. And today, I wanna kind of round out this series and say that, guys, you were made to be a blessing to other people. Like, you were made to be a blessing to other people. Um, I know this, that as we, as we enter into this conversation today, I wanna take you to a passage that I, that I recognize um, that most of us have. Um, I wonder how many of you have ever had this kind of self-doubt thought in your head that the banter that goes on in your mind, if we listen to it, is like, what I do doesn't matter. I'll never make a huge, significant difference. And nobody really notices what I do anyway. And that, that is not something that you are exclusively dealing with. That's something that's been dealt with for literally centuries and millennia all the way back to Moses. Exodus chapter four, if you have your Bibles or if you have the relevant church app, like Hannah said, you can actually look at the Sunday sermon notes on there or you can just follow along on the screen. But it says in Exodus chapter four, verses one and two, but Moses protested. This is when God was telling Moses to go let the children out of Egypt. And he said, what if they don't believe me? 
What if they don't listen to me? I was like, man, does this guy have teenage kids? I, I don't, because that's what it sounded like. Um, he said, what if they say the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him. I think this is one of the most profound questions found in scripture. What is that in your hand? I want, I want to rest in that just a minute. Because I, here's what I want us to do. I want you on the count of three to just say what you do for a living. Just we're gonna say it collectively together. Just say what if you're if you're a doctor, if you're a nurse, if you're if you're an executive, whatever you do. Just on the count of three, I, I want us to just say it together. One, two, three. Pastor. Well, I was doing this. That's what's in your hand. What you do is what's in your hand. And what what Moses didn't understand is that what he was doing was what was in his hand. What was in Moses' hand was a shepherd's staff. And shepherds have this tendency to lead things. They lead sheep. And so Moses thought this doesn't transition to people. And God said, use what's in your hand. God has already placed in your hand what you need for the call that he has on your life. He's already placed it in your hand. And so we go, Paul, God can't, God can't use this. I think it's interesting what my, my dad told me a story when he was a kid, he was in the sixth grade. He went to Tampa Bay Boulevard Elementary School. And if you've ever gone uh, on Tampa Bay Boulevard from the stadium, there's a little old school that's still there that's right down the street from where my dad grew up. It's called Tampa Bay Elementary School. And my dad said he had a sixth grade teacher and, and the sixth grade teacher went around the room and said, what do you want to do for a living? What do you want to do for a living? And he got to my dad and when he was in the sixth grade, he literally knew what he wanted to do. He said, I want to, I want to be a truck driver. That's what I want to do. And she laughed at him. She laughed at him. And he said, I wasn't really kidding. That's really what I, that's kind of what I wanted to do. And that is what my dad did. He was a truck driver for 50 years. He drove a semi. And you say, well, Paul, how, how, what kind of spiritual significance, what kind of significance for God does that, does that translate to? Here's what it translated to. And I, I, I know I've showed, shared with you this story. He had a cassette deck in his, in his semi truck. And my dad, I remember one Christmas, asked for a, a set of the Bible on cassette deck for his truck that he could listen to. And he listened to it so much that he broke the cassette, play, the, cassette uh, the cassettes and had to get a new one because he would literally drive for hour upon hour listening to the word of God. And you know where that translated? He actually started helping out in children's church at the little church that we went to. And he would share with kids about Jesus. And I'll fast forward that till after I was an adult and then I was a kid. My dad was teaching children's ministry here at Relevant Church when we were back over at the Italian club. And he was teaching kids about Jesus. And one day... You can ask Anthony. Anthony went home with his papa. And that simple truck driver shared Jesus with his grandson. You don't think it matters what you do? What's in your hand? Use what's in your hand. You see, God made me and you to serve him and others. That's why you were created. You were created to serve Jesus and to serve other people. Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. It says we're God's workmanship or his masterpiece. We, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Like you're God's masterpiece. You're God's work of art. Like he created you special. You're unique. Nobody in the world is like you. Nobody can be you. You were created in Christ to do good works. And the good works, the way that God describes this, is service. 
It's called, it's called ministry. And ministry doesn't have to be that you stand on stage and, and that you're a pastor. That, that's not ministry. It doesn't mean that you have to sing in the band. It doesn't mean that. Do you realize that, that throughout this ministry, throughout Relevant Church, there are people who do significant things, huge things that no one ever sees? Do you know those connection cards that Hannah talked to you about? Somebody had to strategically put those in the back of the seat pockets so you could see them. And you didn't see them do that. And every week, somebody has to go in and make sure there's toilet paper in the bathroom. Praise God. <laughs> nobody, nobody thanks Jesus for toilet paper until there isn't any. And then you're like, somebody needs to rescue me from the toilet. And no, nobody thinks that, man, the floors, did they just magically get cleaned? No, somebody actually came in yesterday after we spent a whole weekend here with couples and singles doing a relationship conference and trashed the building. They came in and cleaned it before you got here today. Like, those, that's, that's ministry. And, and I know this, that, guys, every single person in here, I, I think people have this crazy idea that only the pastor is the minister or like you have to be on staff, then you're a minister. Every one of you whose calls relevant church, your home is a minister. You've been knighted. Go minister. Because you, you minister in spaces and places that I can never get into. And when you take Jesus to people, it's different. It just, it just hits different when you take Jesus to people. If I walk in and say, oh, I'm Pastor Paul. Whoa. You know, most people, as soon as they hear the word pastor come out of my mouth, they're like, oh, I can't cuss anymore. I can't be me anymore. I can't talk about normal stuff anymore. And then, I, so that's why I just don't tell people I'm a pastor. I just walk into places and I just let them assume what I am because it's a whole lot better and more fun. Um, <laughs> a lot more fun. Because um, then when I do get to share with them, then it's a, real, then it's a party. Um, but here's the deal. God made you, God made us in here to be bivocational ministers for Jesus. We're bivocational ministers of Jesus. And like the, the word bivocational kind of comes from the idea of like bi, uh, how many of you wear bifocals? Anybody wear bifocals in here? Okay, some of you do. That usually, the reason a lot of you didn't is like you're under 40. If you're under 40, you're probably not wearing bifocals. And when I, when I went to the, uh, to the eye doctor and they said I needed to wear bifocals, I said, what can I do to not wear them? Because I just didn't want to be that guy, you know? Like they sit on the end of your nose and you look over the top when you want to see people and then you push them up when you want to read. And I was like, what do I got to do? And so my, my eye doctor said, well, you wear contacts. I said, yeah. She said, you could just wear one. And I was like, nobody knows that. But you guys have no idea that one of my eyes is to read things close up and the other one is to actually see you. And they work independently of each other now. <laughs> Just because I'm that vain. That's all there is to it. Just because I didn't want to wear peepers. I know, it's crazy. I was like, I'm gonna rock this as long as I possibly can. But, but in life, you have a dual purpose to help others and honor God. Like a lot of people, they, we worry about like, what am I supposed to do? Like you're supposed to help people and honor God. And if you can combine those two things, that is incredible. Colossians 3.17 says, and whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So, so I want you to look at this verse and I want, I want you to insert something in, in, in your thinking. Whatever you do or say, that means wherever you go to work and whatever comes out of your mouth at work, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. So then that, that, that eliminates our occupation and it inserts it into what we're doing for God. It matters. What you do and what you say, they matter. Because when we do and say things that are contrary to maybe like a walk with Jesus, and here's the deal. I, I'm not asking you to carry the biggest Bible that you can in your office like, just want y'all to know I'm a Christian. Now sit down, shut up. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Like, that's not it. But you shouldn't be afraid to tell him either. 
Like it should be something that's just a natural overflow of your life. Do you realize that you can take out the garbage as a minister of Jesus? I, I, I loved one of, our, one of our volunteers today said, <clears throat> they were like, man, I said, what did you wanna be when you grew up? And they said, I wanted to ride on the back of a garbage truck. And I promise you, did anybody ever like, when the garbage man used to come and he would hang on the side of the truck, thought that was cool? Did anybody, I, I did. And like one day when I was a youth pastor in Temple Terrace, like we did a community-wide cleanup and they hired the, uh, the trash company from Temple Terrace to help us out with it. And I said, can I ride on the back? And they're like, sure. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I, dude, I'm hanging off the side. I'm like, yeah, give me the trash can. And it kind of went back to... <laughs> it, it, it went back to my, my terrible teenage days where I, I, my parents found me in the newspaper. They just didn't know it was me because my, my buddies and I thought it was really cool uh, once we learned how to drive and got our driver's license to go through neighborhoods um, where people were putting out their trash cans and then we would pull their rolling trash cans behind my buddy's truck and then let them go. <laughs> so after I got older, God made me go pick up trash. <laughs> so... Like, it was, I was not, I was not a good kid. I was not a good kid. And, and so what happens though is like menial tasks that we would deem menial have meaning when they're done with a love for God. The simplest thing, the thing that most people would say, that's not for me, that's not what I do. Like there's somebody in the kids' ministry changing a dirty diaper in the name of Jesus today, and it's your kid's poop. But when it's done with the love of God, it changes you. You see, you were called to serve, and you were saved by the grace of God to serve. Your salvation was not so that you could one day gloriously rise up to heaven with God and spend the rest of your life in heaven with Jesus. You were saved for something, for a purpose. So today I wanna share with you some incredible benefits that happen in your life when you begin to change your focus from self to service. I will tell you, if you have a shift in your mentality of that I'm not gonna focus on self, I'm gonna focus on service, it changes you. Because <clears throat> I know this, one of the greatest benefits of serving, one of the greatest benefits of realizing that you were made on purpose for a purpose is serving others unselfishly creates joy in our lives. Hannah mentioned uh, going to the Dominican Republic uh, with one of our ministry teams. And I will tell you, when you go and you serve somebody else, you come back being ministered to. I don't know why it is. I can't understand it. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It just works that way. Because most people are looking for happiness. Like, that, like if you ask most people in our culture, and if like we did a word on the stream, we said, hey, what are you searching for? I, I, I wanna be happy. But the problem is, how many of you have ever, anybody in here ever been unhappy? Anybody ever been unhappy with the thing that you thought was gonna make you happy? Like, that's the problem. It's like, you're like, ugh, this thing, I got it, and now it's not doing what I thought it was gonna do for me. Some of you, your own occupation is that because you thought it was gonna be the thing. And then it's not. You see, because we try to find happiness in pleasure and power and possessions and position, prestige, popularity. Success doesn't bring satisfaction. Can I tell you that? It doesn't. Success brings success and that's not bad. That's great. But it doesn't mean you're satisfied. Sex doesn't bring satisfaction. It's great. I like it. Just came off a marriage retreat, so I'm still just letting y'all know. Me and Susie going on vacation tomorrow. Just letting y'all know. Your pastor, never. Uh, I was about to get in trouble. Shut your mouth. Shut it. Let me drink water. We're good now. A salary doesn't bring you satisfaction. There's a lot of people 
who I've known over the years who make millions and millions of dollars and they're still not satisfied because there's something that money, money can buy you a house, but it can't make you a home. Money can buy you friends, but it can't build relationships. Like it's just something and it's not bad. And I don't like it when, when people come to church and people tell them that money's bad. Money's not bad. It's, it's, their, it's the desire to just think that it's gonna be the thing that satisfies, that messes it up. Status doesn't bring satisfaction. They're all temporary. Permanent, ongoing joy comes when we serve other people. It comes through service. By giving my life away, God wired us that way, that when you give your life away, more comes in, joy comes in. When you give it away, joy comes in. It's just the way we're made. Here's two secrets of joy. Shift your focus away from yourself and you'll get joy. Shift your focus away from you. The more you focus on you, the more miserable you're going to be. You've gotta shift your focus from inward to outward. When you begin to give your life away, the more you give your life away in helping others, guess what? The more joy you have. Philippians 2.17 shows us this it says but i will rejoice even if i lose my life what yeah because i'm pouring it out as a liquid offering to god just like your faithful service is an offering to god and i want all of you to share in that joy he said as you dump it out joy comes even if that costs you everything there's still joy this is the same guy who he went into prison and then they told him they were gonna kill him. He's like, sweet, kill me because then I get to go see Jesus. They said, okay, we're not killing you. They said, he said, sweet, then I get to share with people about Jesus. They're like, I hate this guy. <laughs> like, like, I can't make him mad. We, we can't do any. If we kill him, he goes to be with Jesus. If we don't kill him, he's gonna tell everybody about Jesus. We can't break him. What does it take to break you? What does it take for you to lose your joy? You see, I know that we have lots of opportunities here at Relevant Church, missions and school mentoring and kids ministry and youth ministry and serving on our tech team. Like we have, if you wanna serve, we got a place. But a lot of people are like, I just don't know where I fit yet. Well, find a place and try it. You don't know if it doesn't fit until you try it on. So try it on. Here's what I will tell you. I will promise you this. If you try to serve in an area and you don't like it, we'll find you another place to serve. It's great. It's like a return policy. Like you can return your service. Like you can say, listen, this one doesn't fit me. It's like, it's like sending it back to Amazon. How many of y'all have ever used Amazon as a rental place? <laughs> Do not lie. I, mm, I have been guilty. I needed to use something. I was like, I'm gonna order it from Amazon. So he goes, well, then what are you gonna do? I said, I'm gonna send it back. She goes, that is terrible. I was like, I know. And I started feeling bad about it when I realized that a buddy of mine actually had sell stuff on Amazon. And every time it comes back, like he gets a ding from Amazon, like that his product's bad. Every time it goes back. And I, I didn't know that. Then I started feeling bad. Not so bad that I haven't sent stuff back since then. <laughs> Full disclosure here. I, I am rails off today. I, know, I realize that. I am complete rails off, okay? So I got six minutes to finish this thing. We got, holy mackerel. All right. Philippians 2, 4 says, let each of you look not only to your own interest, <coughs> but also to the interest of others. That's literally what we're called to do. We're supposed to look out for the interest of other people. Susie and I use this verse all the time in doing marriage counseling, all the time. Because all the time, I promise you, if you're struggling in your marriage or you're struggling in any relationship, whether it's a marital relationship, a romantic relationship, a roommate relationship, a relationship with somebody at work, I promise you, if you will walk out this verse, I promise you it'll change the relationship. Look out for their interests first. 
I love how the message version actually breaks this uh, verse down. And I don't use the message version a lot, but sometimes like the message version just, it just says it differently and I, and I like it. And it says this, forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Now, okay, I get it now. Forget yourself long enough. Just do something for somebody else one time. Remember, we were made on purpose for a purpose. The other way serving brings joy is this. Use your gifts to help other people. Just help other people. And use the gifting that God has given you to help other people. Joy comes from getting our focus off of me and using my gifts to serve somebody else. 1 Peter 4.10 says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve other people. If you wanna know what your spiritual gift is, if you wanna learn what those are and you don't know what those things are, here's what I want you to do. If you're interested in learning what your spiritual gift is, I want you to use the digital connection card or the connection card in the back of the seats because we have a way that we can help you understand what your gifting is and how that you can best connect. But you wanna know one better? If you go to Belong class with Susie on September 15th, she's gonna give you a lot of that information and help you understand, what's my gifting? Where do I best fit? And then she'll help you along with some of her team to actually help you get plugged in. Serving other people also improves your relationships. The root of every... <clears throat> The root of every single relational problem in your life is self-centeredness. It just is. Look at them. Look at every problem you've ever had with a relationship. Usually the root problem is self-centeredness. That's the root. And if you don't get to the root, what you end up doing, here's the deal. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a cut and never cleaning the cut. You never fix it. You have to get the root of self-centeredness out or you'll never fix any of the relationships that you have. Proverbs 13, 10 says, pride leads to conflict. Those who take advice are wise. Anytime you have a conflict in your marriage, ego's showing up. And you're not being a servant, you're being selfish. Anytime pride shows up at work and you're not serving somebody else, you're not helping somebody else, pride shows up. When you change... When you change, when I change, it changes the relationship. And most of the time, what we want is we want the other person to change. Here's what I know. People go to relationship conferences or people come to marriage counseling with Susie and I, and they want the other person to change. That's why they're coming. Do you know what they're doing? Let me just share with you. I got something to say here. And, like, and they're just giving you all the stuff that, they're, that the other person is doing. I go, and this is usually my first thing. What about you? What's your part in this? What are you willing to own that you have done in this relationship to cause the tension? Because we all got to own our stuff. Culture says that a little differently. But we got to own our stuff. Because if we don't, pride creeps in. Here, here's, here's a life hack for you. Everybody loves life hacks these days. Here's a life hack for you. Life hack to become unselfish. Copy Jesus. Life hack. You want a life hack? There's a life hack. You want a life hack for selfishness? Copy Jesus. Be unselfish. If you're struggling with selfishness, copy Jesus. Matthew 20, 28 says, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to to serve others and gave his life as a ransom for many. Let me give you a case in point. Right before Jesus died, they're in the, they're in the upper room. They're having Passover. The disciples had set up the Passover field, uh, feast and they're coming in and they're all, all the disciples walk in, they sit around the table and they missed the basic Jewish thing that they were supposed to do. Because every time you were a Jewish person and you were coming in for dinner, somebody had to wash feet. There was no servant there at the door to wash feet. Nobody had been assigned to that. No disciple wanted that assignment, so nobody took it. So after they all sat down, Jesus got up and went to each of them and washed their feet. He served in the lowest capacity possible. And in doing so, he modeled for them what their life should look like thereafter. 
The more you bless people, the more you're blessed by God. Proverbs eleven twenty five 25 says, the generous will prosper and those who refresh others will refresh themselves. The generous will prosper and those who refresh others will refresh themselves. You know, a lot of times, um, people, when, when we talk about stuff, are, are like, we are, not, we are not a church that talks about finances a lot. Like, some of you have been in church your whole life, or, or maybe that's why you don't go to church. And like, we don't pass buckets at this church. Like, we have, like, boxes in the back. And, and I love that. And, and, and sometimes it creates a little more tension because some people don't know that there's a need. And if they don't know that there's a need, they're like everything, these lights must just come on magically every month. I don't, I don't know. Every, the air condition, I know some of you think it's too cold in here anyway. And I think it's just right. But um, it is what it is. But like, it, it takes money to do all those things. And some people say, I don't, have, I don't have money to give or I don't have time to give or I don't have talents to give. Like we, we don't, we don't, I don't have, I don't have. And I just know this, whatever seed we sow, we get back. And here's, like, I've heard people use this like illustration like poorly because they're like, oh, sow seeds into this, sow seeds into that, and you're gonna get this. But I do know this. There is a principle of sowing and reaping. There is, and it's biblical. Like you don't sow seeds and get a seed back. You don't. You don't sow one seed and get one seed back. If you sow a seed, you know what? You get a plant back that produces multiple seeds. Like that's just the way. That's, and so here's the deal. When we sow our talents, you know what God gives us? the opportunity to your, share more of what he's given us. And so I, I just know this, that I'm always, I'm always honest here at Relevant, um, sometimes too honest, um, and, uh, and I get that. But I also know this, that I, I try to tell you where we are and what's going on. And I'll tell you this, this summer we have done more ministry than I think we've ever done. Like we, we, we took kids to camp. It was an incredible camp. We saw, we saw dozens of kids get saved. We did more bunk beds in the Dominican Republic than we have ever done in our entire lives. Like, we, like in the entire history of the church. It, it's been an incredible thing. But in doing that, like there's an outflow and then there's an inflow. And the outflow didn't necessarily match the inflow this summer. And the summer, like, we did more ministry in the leanest time of the year, and like, it's hurt us financially. I'm just letting you know. Are we about to shut the doors? No. But did Tim and I have a conversation this week of what can we do to kind of fix and tighten some things? And I, I just wanted you to know that, because like over the summer months, like I just evaluated it this past week, and like I could wait and say, I'll just wait and pretend like it'll get better. And I just don't want to do that. Um, we try to be really good stewards of what God has given us. But also I know that sometimes like, I believe that culturally we're just, everybody's struggling financially and I get it. Um, and so I just wanted to let you know kind of where we are that over the past three months, uh, when I looked at this last quarter, like we're off in our giving in the regular giving that helps us to do ministry by about $40,000. And I, I was like, whoa, how did that happen? And, um, and it wasn't because of overspending. It wasn't like, you know, you're not paying for my vacation tomorrow. I just want you to know that. It's like, <laughs> I, I'm not flying to Hawaii and you're not paying for it. I don't do that. I don't, I don't have a jet or a helicopter or anything like that. Um, <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Bad. Um, but I just wanted you to know. Um, and here's the deal. I believe this. This is God's house and it's God's church and God does what he wants to do in his church. But you're also his people and you call this your home. And so I would just say this. Listen, um, maybe, maybe for you, you're like, man, you know what? We haven't been doing, we haven't been giving because we just didn't really know if there was a need. I just encourage you, you know, do what God tells you to do. That's it. I don't care. I'm gonna leave the rest up to God but I know it's my responsibility as a pastor to let you know kind of what's going on because I don't want you to miss out on the blessing of what God does when you are generous too. Because serving others, even through our finances, brings meaning to our lives. It brings meaning to our lives. Can I tell you, meaning doesn't come from money. Meaning comes from ministry. But you don't get to do ministry without money. Like that's just the way it is. It doesn't happen. And so Mark, six, Mark chapter eight says this, if you try to hang on to your life, you're gonna lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you'll save it. And what do you begin to profit 
What benefit is it if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? First Corinthians says, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable, always working enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is useless. Nothing. Nothing you do for Jesus is useless. I'm gonna give you the last thing about serving and why it's so important. I, I think serving is the most incredible way to leave a legacy. To leave a legacy. I think that people wanna create a legacy. Like people wanna be remembered for something. But how many of you went to college at a place and there was a building named after somebody you had no idea who they were? How many of you like, so you could get a building named after you. But do you realize that statistically speaking, after about three generations, no matter how great you are, no one will know who you are and no one will care what you've done. They won't. So you can choose and we can choose to leave a legacy that is temporary, or we can choose to leave a legacy that's eternal. Here's what I know. Eternal legacies are like this. That somebody gives to something that God is doing here at Relevant Church. And then we start a kid's ministry because we have volunteers who can do it and then we have to buy some things for kids ministry to launch a kids ministry and it starts working because I will tell you that 20 years ago when we launched Relevant Church there was a kids ministry here's what the kids ministry was we put one person in a room and we said watch these kids because it was my kids and it was Carl's kids and it was Jamie and Carly's kid like there were like four kids in the whole ministry and so we just shoved somebody in a corner and we said watch those kids over there that was what we did and it began to grow. But because, because somebody said, I want to leave a legacy that's eternal, they started giving so that we could build a children's ministry. And now, like, if you've never walked through our children's ministry, you should just walk through it. Because I, I've had people come in here off the street and they go, I had no idea all this was going on. But I know this. My son gave his life to Jesus because of this kid's ministry. And some of your kids gave their lives to Jesus because of this ministry. And that's eternal. And some of you have given money so that we could go to the Dominican to build beds to share the gospel. And one day, this is the eternal impact. We are going to walk in heaven and somebody from the Dominican Republic who you can't communicate with because they speak Spanish and you speak English now, but one day maybe we'll speak the same language. I, that would be really awesome if we could like roll that back from the whole Tower of Babel thing. Never mind. Whole another sermon I could preach on that. Um, but like we roll that back and they come up to you and they go, you gave money so somebody could build a bed for me and I slept in that bed, but the bed, they told me about Jesus and that Jesus loved me. And I wanted you to know I gave my life to Jesus because of you, because of your gift. Like, that's why serving matters. Like it matters. It's the gospel that matters. The memories, Proverbs 10, the memories of the righteous is a blessing. But the name of the wicked will rot. Matthew 20, 26 says, if you want to be great, anyone who wants to be great among you must be a servant. You want to be great? You want to be remembered? Serve somebody. You were made for more. Your occupation is not who you are. Your occupation leads you to an opportunity to be a minister for Jesus right where you are, wherever that is. I just encourage you, step in. When you walk out of here, walk into ministry. You didn't walk into church, but you're walking out a minister today. You have been given the calling to serve somebody else. And I pray that you would do that with as much enthusiasm as you possibly can. Let's pray. God, we love you. God, you're good to us. And we pray that God, you would help us to recognize that we are all called to serve. If we haven't found a place to serve, God, I pray that we would find a place to serve today. And we would realize that God, we have this incredible opportunity to use the gifting and calling that you have on our lives to do something for someone else. And God, you, you allow us to use our, our finances. You allow us to use our talents and our gifts. And God, I pray that we would, we would couple all of those things together and we would say, God, I want to be all in with what you're doing. And we'll thank you and praise you 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand and worship with us? And I wanna share with you, man, I love this church. I love our family here at Relevant Church, and I'm so glad that you're here. If you're a guest, man, I'd love to meet you at the front door. Just grab my hand and say, hi, Susie and I will be at the front door. We'd just love to say, hey, we're so glad you're here. We're glad that you found Relevant Church, and I pray that you found a family uh, that you go, I could, I could be part of that place. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here. Let's worship.